dark are these times, and dark my mood. Let's be real. When it comes to the Fey Enchantress, there isn't much to say. She spends her days prancing around the woods, talking to animals, and pretending like she has real power. But the truth is, she's nothing more than a glorified forest nymph, a mere shadow of a real sorceress. Her title, Fey Enchantress, sounds like something straight out of a fairy tale, and that's exactly where she belongs. She's a mere character in a storybook, pretending like she holds the power to change the world, when in reality, she can't even change her own fate. And let's not forget that she's a cheap imitation of Morgan Le Fay, a real sorceress with actual power. The Fay Enchantress is nothing but a poor copy, trying to ride on the coattails of a true magical being. The Fey Enchantress may think she's powerful, but she's just a delusional forest sprite, playing make-believe in a world that doesn't exist. She's ultimately nothing more than a sideshow attraction. Let's also take a moment to appreciate the sheer absurdity of it all. The Fey Enchantress, a bastard of Morgan Le Fay, trying to embody the Lady of the Lake in a world that's supposed to be based on King Arthur's kingdom. It's like a bad fan fiction that's trying too hard to be original. But hey, let's not be too hard on her. After all, she's just a poor imitation of her mother, trying to make a name for herself in a world that doesn't make any sense. Maybe one day she'll find her true calling when she's not being nuked by the rat men. But until then, let's all have a good laugh at the ridiculousness of it all. Welcome everyone, Christine here with my campaign overview guide for Morgan Le Fay, or the Fay Enchantress for Bretonia and Warhammer Free Immortal Empires, who is actually a lot better in the campaign than you might necessarily expect. Or at least she has some pretty solid enough bonuses on the campaign side of things. Now, for her Lord effects, she gets Blessing of the Lady as an ability and she causes a fear. Now, Blessing of the Lady uh, is right over here. It gives 20% physical resistance if leadership is higher than broken. So she's actually quite capable of surviving uh, quite a bit of damage. Then her special skill line is not necessarily special, though she does get recruiting rank for Grail Knights and Grail Guardians, melee attack for Grail Knights and Grail Guardians, and melee defense. So she makes your super duper high tier units even stronger. She does get growth, uh, five, plus five in all provinces, as well as free control in the local province. The control is not really an issue for Bretonia. She does have basically a unicorn as a mount, and she is a lore of life uh, caster. So she's pretty decent. She only has two items, not necessarily great items, though uh, there are at least two missions to get them and rewards for doing so. So there is some money to be made. She does start in Carcassonne, and here's the thing to understand about the, Breto uh, the Bretonians. They have a lot of uh, provinces with just two regions. Now, for most factions, this would not be a good situation because most factions would want to have more regions in a province to really take advantage of them economically. For Bretonia, however, their economy is really individualized based on the region they're in because each region that you're building up economically, you need fields, you need the windmill. So for Bretonia itself, you actually benefit from having provincial capitals because it benefits your unit recruitment. Specifically, you need the tier 4 barracks to get foot squires and you need the tier 5 um, stables to be able to get royal hippogriff knights. Though, of course, you also need a tier 3 in order to increase your hero capacity for paladins. And you need tier 5. So Bretonia is the kind of faction for, at least from a unit recruitment perspective, they do want a lot of provincial capitals because each provincial capital will give them a tier 4 armory. Each armory will give two armor to all armies. That is a fairly substantial amount of power that you can get if you're playing Bretonia. Now, the one you start with uh, has a Cinnabar mining pit, but that's not what you want to focus on. What you want to do in this particular campaign is you want to get knights errant as recruitment options so cancel this uh get the fields first because you're going to need the peasant bowman then once this is uh canceled you want to start building up uh start building up for knights errant yes. what you'll want to do with your army is go over Stop here it. and take Brion. so you wipe out Stop. this minor green skin faction now here's the issue that you're going to encounter in this campaign there's a lot of territory to cover and a lot of factions to fight. Now, Grom will wipe out Aquitaine if you let him do so. 
but you can stop Brom if you're quick enough. Your army might seem pathetic and weak, and it is in a lot of ways, but it is capable of beating Rom in a one-on-one -on -one fight, provided you're careful. Because you do have some powerful units. You do start with the Paladin, you do have Battle Programs, you do have Free Peasant Bowmen, you do have uh, Grail Guardians, which are a much better unit than anything Grom can throw against you, and you do have the Blessed Field uh, Trebuchets, which can do a significant amount of range damage. So you have the army to be Grom. Like, see, the thing about the Greenskins is Greenskins are not necessarily very strong on an individual level. It's the sheer mass of them that the AI throws against you that makes them so powerful. So if you rush Grom, you can kill him before he becomes a problem. Um, and as Grom, you want to rush other factions before and grow very quickly as as well. Now you do have one, uh, you do have two very significant campaign-wide benefits. One, you get 15% casualty replenishment. That is actually really high casualty replenishment, and it stacks with the casualty replenishment that you can get otherwise. That is very substantial. Two, you have five peasants to the economy from the start so that means you can get a lot of peasants to your army very very quickly which can be an issue for Breton for other Bretonian factions because your peasants drive your economy if you go over the peasant econo economy cap you're going to suffer significantly uh, economically speaking you'll lose that upkeep benefit as well as uh, start uh, your farms will start declining in terms of their economic output now you do want to rely on farms because the farms allow you to recruit peasant bowmen and you want to get peasant bowmen and then eventually of course you want to upgrade them to get uh, po with pox arrows because pox arrows are poisoned arrows so they'll weaken the enemy your best bet of an army comp is to rely on a combination of foot squires when you get them don't bother with the other infantry units they're pretty garbage but foot squires if you can get them fully upgraded by the armory sure you could bother with other infantry units if you get a lot of armories to buff their armor but otherwise don't bother because their leadership is really really bad foot squires are the only decent infantry unit that bretonia does have uh, with one major exception, but it's not recruited from the barrack chain, it's recruited from the Grail Chapel, and these are the Battle Pilgrims, which, while they don't have a lot of armor, they do have some pretty good stats otherwise, including Frenzy. So they're capable of holding their own. So what you really want to do as Bretonia is get to a tier 3 in order to be able to get the Grail Chapel and be able to recruit not just the damsels, but also the battle pre pilgrims. The Grail Reliquary is not really good, though it can help your peasant armies if you do decide to recruit a bunch of these guys, because it can help their leadership, but it's not really a good unit in any way, shape, or form. Um, but yeah, having five peasants, having Who casualty replenishment. So your campaign plan should be to try and wipe out Grom. However, there is something to consider here. You might wish to wait until Grom has wiped out Bordello or taken over their territory. The reason is that you cannot confederate with other Bretonian factions. I'll use Welcome Caravan as an example. You cannot Bretonia. confederate with other Bretonian factions unless you've done research for it. The only one who's an exception of this, like Rapunzel is an exception, but if you're playing the Fae Enchantress or Leon Leoncore, you need to do research. The research is found over here. It's actually worth doing because it gives you 10 peasants available to your faction and allows you to confederate the other factions. The way it works is that you, let's say I want to confederate with Aquitaine. Well, I research that and then I'll either have to spend 700 chivalry or 500 chivalry and or 5,000 gold in order to confederate with them, or I can just wait, get the diplomatic benefits and as well as the money that those diplomatic benefits will bring, because defensive alliance will that, and just confederate normally, but you first need to do it. Now, you will gain chivalry fr uh, from this and those 10 peasants at the end, but it may not necessarily be worth rushing for that. Research-wise, you might actually be better off trying to research water pumps as quickly as possible but this depends on how many regions you have and how fast you can expand because this is 30 turns uh this will take 30 turns and you don't have a way to increase uh your research time you could also go for improved construction it's 3000 uh, gold other things that you might want to consider is your diplomatic relations with your fellow humans with dwarves and so on now campaign starting situation once you deal with Grom, and you should deal with him very quickly, you will have a bit of a problem in this campaign. Like, you can take the massive Oracle for yourself, 
and you do want it because while it is a mountain and thus it does have that control penalty and construction time and income from buildings and construction cost pen penalty, it's still worth taking. But here's what typically happens in this kind of campaign. Orion will deal with uh, Paragon. You might want to join Orion in beating the crap out of these guys. Because one, you can take the territory for yourself and they, they start with a tier 3 capital. So you will have a tier 2 settlement for yourself, which means you can increase uh, and maybe you can even take it when it's already tier uh, tier 4, actually. Though that's not necessarily go always going to happen, but it does start as tier 3. There are advantages in taking it as a tier 3 settlement. And then you can obviously take... Um, it, one of the things to know, you are not restricted, restrained in any the way, shape, or form from just demand. literally declaring war on Bretonian factions. And that might be your best game plan. Like, you might want to make a deal with Karak Ziffin, who is at war with Baston. Um, take Bordolo yourself, if Grom hasn't taken it, because they do have a pretty damn nice port over there. The Bordolo port is a pretty damn nice port, can g give you a lot of economic benefits. Um, and then maybe take Musalon. Do you might want to leave Liu, Liu and Leon Kerr to do so. But just be careful when it comes to diplomatic deals with Bretonian factions because you don't want to restrain yourself when it comes to it. Also, some research is just not necessarily worth bothering about because, for instance, Artois is not going to survive long enough for you to actually be able to confederate them because, like, Kemmler, even if you rush for it, is likely going to wipe them out very, very quickly. Uh, though you probably should well, make a deal with these Pritker dwar Dwarves, yeah, just gank up on Gabaston, um, and then gank up on Kemmler, give them the Blackstone Post, and then eventually give them Grungzint, and you'll have the Dwarves securing the mountains for you, and you might want to move on Marienburg at one point. But, any advance to the north, which is basically Lewin's campaign plan, any advance to the north has to be balanced out by the following fact. You've got two legendary lords that are very hostile towards you. They might wipe each other out, but they might also just as well declare war on you and try and wipe you out. And these are, of course, Ikeklaw and Mogur. Now, Mogur is a footnote, basically. Like, yeah, he can be powerful in battle, but the army he has won't be really that good. The, the Beastmen suffer from the fact that... Uh, the Beastman AI specifically suffers from the fact that in order to unlock their higher tier units, they need to get Dread and they need to do those rituals. The problem the Beastman AI has is actually doing those rituals. I think they might need special rules to actually be more relevant. Or just like, if a Beastman faction stays alive long enough, they can be more useful. Though, if that could be paired with just removing that really annoying Beastman event where they just spawn out of nowhere to just harass you, that would be great. Um, but yeah, Ike Claw in particular, can use the underway, and he will use the underway to attack your territory. Brion should rel be relatively safe, though you also have to consider the naval invasion aspect, because Mogur and Ikit can take uh, via the sea to just hit Brion and nuke it. So you're going to have to balance expanding to the north to defending yourself. You don't necessarily want to deal with Estalia yourself, um, because what's going to happen is Estalia is going to be raised to the ground very quickly, at least northern Estalia is going to be raised to the ground very quickly, and then uh, a lot of it will be a chaos ruin for much of your uh, campaign, and you're going to have to spend a lot of money. It's better in this campaign to try and take over all of the Bretonian coast, because you don't necessarily have a lot of foes here. Like, you have Elfarian, who's going to be very friendly and very happy that you kill uh, Grom for him, and then, yeah, you have Nakari, that might be an issue, and maybe Belakor shows up all, all the way here. But really, typically speaking, it's Musalon, the Red Duke, and Kemmler, and you are capable of doing it. Like, just a combination of cavalry and peasant bowmen should be enough to deal with them. The bigger problem with this campaign, though, is all the sieges that will exist over here. But you do start with an artillery unit, and as Bretonia, you do have one major advantage when it comes to sieges you have the ability of constructing artillery at tier two don't waste it now i would not necessarily recommend it to start building artillery, artillery because you start with a really really powerful artillery piece but you may want to do so pretty early on in your campaign to be able to knock on knock out the walls the problem in a lot of siege battles is that you get funneled for the gates because a lot of factions lack the ability to destroy walls very quickly so you get funneled for the gates and you just get killed uh, it makes dealing with sieges miserable, um, but you do have that ability as Bretonia to at least knock down the walls and then make do, um, and then make do with uh, with your cavalry. Though just 
uh, something worth bearing in mind, though, Bretonian cities themselves are actually fairly narrow. So they're not necessarily well suited towards cavalry. Like the Empire has much better settlements for using cavalry in them. The Bretonians actually have pretty bad settlements. Like they're very, uh, very narrow streets in a lot of cases. Uh, so your cavalry may have issues actually navigating them. By the way, one thing to mention about the Grail Guardians, they will cost you a lot in terms of your upkeep because you don't start with any vows. You're going to have to get these vows. Well, the frauds, basically, in the case of, uh, of her. But you will need to get these vows unlocked if you're going to be able to reduce your upkeep. Because you otherwise, you're going to spend 400 upkeep on these Grail Guardians, which is not necessarily all that great. But it does... Um, actually, even with that, you're still going to uh, spend a lot. Like, the Grail Guardians are just a really, really expensive... Uh, unit like Grail Knights. I guess it does count Grail Guardians, but I'm not uh, entirely certain when it comes down to it. Uh, so if we look at the Grail, the Royal Pegasus Knights, yeah, it should really. It it absolutely should count for it, but I'm not entirely certain that it does. But it should if you unlock that. The problem though is your second vow may be a bit tricky, uh, trickier to deal with. In fact, you might benefit in fulfilling your first vow, waiting for you to do so, and then eliminating uh, Grom in order to be able to secure your second vow, the Fraught of Wisdom, at the same time, that's 10% campaign movement range. Getting the Fraught of Virtue, that takes longer because you need to kill five lords in battles, that's one example. But you can get the second vow, and this is for her, for another army you might build. Uh, build. One of the things to mention about Bretonia, you don't have supply lines to deal with. So you do have to pay the upkeep of whatever units you're getting in a second army, absolutely, but you do not have to deal with supply lines. And so you can get the second Lord very quickly in your campaign and start getting those vows up. Like one of the main things to worry about when you're playing Bretonia is getting those vows. And you can ensure that two Lords, as well as one hero, will have the second vow finished by the time you deal with Grom. But make sure, but the vow requires you to kill a legendary lord of the greenskins. Just bear in mind. You might also benefit from keeping Scrag alive because you could also complete some vows using him if you're killing him in battle. Yeah, Grom, one of the most powerful legendary lords uh, in the game, just being used as as, as a tool to uh, get some vows unlocked. But you just eliminate his army here, and a lot of the power he has on the campaign just dim uh, is diminished, and then you wait for him to respawn. You're unlikely to finish the first vow before you have to face him in battle. So you'll have to wait for him to respawn. That takes a couple of turns. You might take one else in the meantime. Or... Uh, you might, uh, or you might take Parabon in the meantime, and then go for the massive Oracle. But that's the campaign situation for the Fey Enchantress. She does have quite a bit of potential. I'd certainly say it's a better situation than what poor Lowen Leonkur has to deal with. Because yeah, you do have Ekeklaw and Mogur uh, to, that can attack your capital, but he. But the problem is. Uh, but the problem for Luin is that he has Bellacor that's going to attack him constantly in this port over here in particular. And he wants to take expand over here to the south and, and take over it, Musala and all that. Whereas as the Fey Enchantress, yeah, you do have Ekeclaw, but you also have Belagar to help you with Ekeclaw, uh to keep him in check. So uh, you're, not, you're in a better position and you can recruit more units because you have five uh, peasants extra to the peasant economy. That's all there is to it. Costian signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.